afternoon, everybody. Um, I want to pick up where Dr. Reyes have uh, done an excellent job and focus my presentation to you all um, on on-farm practices and how they connect to the wider concept of circularity we talked about. Um, again, the circle is a very symmetrical figure, so there's a lot of interest in just getting to that perfect way of operation. And some of these principles are um, as articulated in the MacArthur Foundation, which did a lot of the work around this, and also our Society for Agricultural and Biological Engineers a Society. Um, those five principles are improving efficiency of using resources, designing out pollution and waste, also keeping the products and materials moving in that cycle continuously, and regenerating natural resources and providing economical benefits uh, while we're at it. That does sound like a tall order, and there's quite a bit to be done here. Um, the good news is in that particular system that we work with, which is the livestock or animal crop system, has historically relied on the circle model to think about systems or to think about how it does the work. Uh, we, we understand that animal and the manure are closely linked to the soil and to the crop that feeds the animal. Uh, we understand that there is removal and additions that happen. Some of these removals and additions are valuable and economies that were dependent on it, uh, but some are losses or emissions to the environment. And this really lines up perfectly to how we manage the system. Uh, I would say not just in the past decades, but maybe even millennia, that has always been the model where animal production and cropping have been uh, integrated. Uh, and as we... Uh, step into the modern farm or how we run our animal production farms today. Uh, one of the figures we think about is um, this figure that I borrowed uh, from the uh, NRCS manual handbook for uh, designing uh, agricultural waste management uh, systems. These boxes represent the stages or the steps of how agricultural waste, again, I my preference is to use the term manure, uh, because that's really what it is. And um, it describes the different stages from its production of the manure to the collection, its transfer to storage, to treatment, and ultimately to the utilization on cropland. Uh, this system can be as simple as a pasture, where all of the steps of manure management happen at the same point, or it could be uh, significantly complex uh, between separation and treatment. And we'll go through the, these different components. But an important point also to keep in mind is that these systems or these stages of the process, many of us know that they are uh, associated with some losses. Uh, these are losses to the environment. And depending on the focus, these can be uh, odorous emissions. These can be uh, nitrogen, volatile nitrogen forms. These can be greenhouse gases. And oftentimes, they are a mix of everything. So really, when we are managing manure, we are talking about so many things at the same time. And it is one of the ways that uh, we can focus this conversation is to think about the circularity and all the different dimensions that we are managing our resources when we manage manure. So as we talk about manure management and what we do, we also recognize that on a farm, uh, our management is sort of guided by a lot of the regulatory uh, uh, infrastructure that we have that is guiding operations that present the minimum that production has to maintain. These are uh, can be as uh, federal acts or statutes or uh, on a state level or even on a municipal level. And those regulate how manure is utilized and ideally to use it as a resource and a valuable product, not as a waste product. And Many of us working in this space recognizes that one of the biggest tools that we have in our toolbox is the different uh, conservation practices, the, the established ones we all know and the newer ones that are being developed. The conservation, depending on whether we are talking about climate or climate smart, or are we talking about nutrients or other dimensions of sustainable operations. Um, you see on the bottom of my slide here, the four R's that many of us are familiar with on using nutrients in particular, uh, related to the rate, the timing, the application uh, form, and the placement. Uh, but those are more in alignment with the fertilizer, synthetic fertilizer, commercial fertilizer. When we go into the manure side of the equation, uh, some of the practices that you see here on my slide, and those are um, counterclockwise from the upper left corner, 
You get to see Lagoon cover. You get to see manure injection um, in season. You get to see a cover crop. Then you see a, a set of fire being applied into a poultry house. You see a solid liquid separation. And finally, on the lower left corner, you get to see a manure storage shed for, for litter in particular. And uh, depending on the management, that could be a composting facility designed as a covered structure. So as we look at these particular practices, um, some of us have, are familiar with all of them or parts of them. You can see that they have they accomplish more than one goal. Um, we are reducing uh, pollution or emissions or losses. We are increasing use efficiency of resources. We are conserving in particular the carbon and the nitrogen and any of the volatile components. Um, we are keeping the resource in cycling as well. Um, and in many cases, as we will see, there are incentives that are being developed to where these practices are associated with a compensation for production. So there's economic benefits that are being developed today to some of these conservation practices, whether that's a cost share to implement a technology or the generation of credits that are offsetting any off-farm entities that is looking for these offset credits. So these are sort of the tools that we have on our toolkit when we are inside of our farm. As we step outside and look at crop and animal production on a larger scale, that's a national scale, we start to see some trends are playing out. And again, this data is slightly out of date today. The most recent data here is 15, 2015, but it illustrates the point. So the figures that you're looking at today shows on the vertical axis the percentage of operation farms or animal operations um, that do not have cropping happening on the same farm. And then on the horizontal axis, you get to see what type of animals and what the trend looked like between 1996 and 2015. So we get to see some trends we sort of expect. We know that dairy production is closely tied to the feed sources. And uh, so the decoupling of cropping from uh, animals is much smaller than what we see, for instance, in poultry production, that it exceeded 50% um, of the poultry operations do not manage cropping farms or crop production uh, within the farm. Now, an important point to keep in mind that this trend doesn't necessarily mean that the manure does not get land applied, but it simply says that the, there is a separation in, in, in the individual facility, what it focuses on it operates. Another figure to help us understand that is, is what you're seeing right now. On the vertical axis, you're seeing percentage of the manure applied on these crops on the horizontal axis, and how did the crop land receive that manure? So the darkest, darkest color in the bottom, this is that some manure produced on the facility itself. And then it could be purchased represented by the light yellow color. Then the light blue color represents that it has been obtained from a source of manure at no cost, essentially for free. And then finally, the darker blue that some compensation was associated with accessing the manure. So that tells us that there is a whole host of arrangements that are existing. The source of this data is a national uh, survey, a USDA uh, NASS or a statistical uh, service. Uh, but it's important to know that there are certain crops um, that are closely integrated, corn um, and barley in particular, and others like cotton and peanuts, typically you see those in the southeastern United States where either uh, manure is purchased or at times made available for free. And these represent to us the instances of manure where its value isn't fully realized simply because of where it is being produced compared to where it is being needed. Um, so we get to see that trend again in this slide here. So on the left-hand side, you get to see the distribution of the different crops, uh, the key uh, land crops, corn, wheat, soybean, cotton, hay, and fruits. Uh, feed ingredients, when we talk in the animal production, are primarily uh, corn and soybean, and to a degree some wheat. But you see most of the, the, the grain uh, production happening in the Midwestern states. Uh, on the right-hand side, you're seeing the phosphorus generation in the manure as a proxy to de describe where the manure is being generated, where animals are. And the different shades of the colors represent whether it's pigs, poultry, dairy, or beef. And when you abstract these two maps, you arrive at the figure that's simplified at the bottom. I'm using these figures from Spiegel 
uh, and others on, in 2020, the study that looked at that broadly and explained that these trends where grains and, and uh, feed ingredients are being cultivated in areas where a lot of the consumption actually is happening a very long distance from them. So there is a long distance transfer of nutrients and feed across the country. And as a result of that, we get to observe some of these trends where what you call sheds or areas where the nutrients are being generated uh, and you need, a, you're, you need a significant land base in order to manage these nutrients uh, more sustainably. We certainly see one of the largest areas here in the Southeast in North Carolina and around us where a density of animal production exists without the, uh, as the required land base to actually assimilate these nutrients and help us create that circularity of management. We start to see the challenges in that space. So as we transition from this to what are our opportunities to improve circularity, we need to, to be clear on what we're talking about. We could be talking about nutrients. And even with nutrients, we, we recognize that nutrients, there is nitrogen, which is highly volatile and can be uh, its management even on agricultural land is a year by year while other uh, more conserved nutrients like phosphorus or micros and salts, they can build up over long periods of time and their management can require a long-term strategy to be sustainable. Another attribute, and Dr. Uh, Veyes mentioned the energy part. Uh, there is an opportunity for us to improve circularity through the energy part of the manure. Similarly, water management, as well as the value added products. These could be uh, feed, these could be uh, composites, fuels, and so on. So as we talk about the nutrients, um, one of the, and, and uh, I, I do know Dr. Anderson will talk in detail about the nutrients, but it's helpful to invite you to think about this example. And I'm using examples here from a study um, that was published um, last year uh, out of the Netherlands that took the example three examples representing different scales of food production. What you're seeing on the slide in front of you right now is simply a crop and soil and showing nitrogen as it moves between fertilizer entering from the bottom left and a product harvested on the green arrow on the upper right. The numbers are really not important for the point here, but it's important to think about the flow of nitrogen through that cycle. And the fact that we can describe that system in different ways, we can describe it in terms of the efficiency of use, the output compared to the inputs. We can describe it in terms of how many cycles the nutrient can move in that circle, or we can describe it into the relative uh, losses leaving the system at every node. So there are different indicators and we can be used to describe the system differently. At this system scale is different than when we step into a, an integrated feed and uh, crop system uh, and animal, we get to see the nodes and opportunities for losses and inputs and outputs increase. It becomes even more complex when we start, we start to talk about a region scale like you're seeing in front of you today now. So it's a very uh, uh, interesting study and I encourage those interested on in the different ways to read it to, to refer to that study on the different indicators. Uh, but you get to see all of the different opportunities for technologies that we already know and practice on farm to control these losses, whether from the manure, from the soil, um, during application and so on, and certainly from an animal production perspective from feed efficiency. Now, as we talk about the energy, we have a different story. We actually are seeing a success story in increasing the energy circularity in manure. What you're seeing here is a, is a map um, that I borrowed from the EPA AgStar uh, tool that you can access to show you um, the digesters across the United States by type of manure. Red circles representing the dairy and cattle. Um, green are representing pig digesters or uh, uh, swine digesters. Uh, the pink color represents poultry and the gray are representing the um, uh, mixed digesters. So there is a uh, year on year we are seeing a, a significant increase in these systems. That's because they are managed to align the economics and the emission reduction in many fronts. So um, and some of these are valuable lessons for us as we target the other attributes of manure. If we shift to talk about water circularity, we certainly from a research perspective are able to achieve pure clean drinking water on the farm. And several farms around the country 
have achieved that benchmark. Um, it always depends on the context. Where are the economics, the access to clean water, the challenges in managing the manure water? So while the technology exists and we're able to do it, whether it aligns with the economic benefits or not, it depends on where you are around the country. In areas where water quantity is a constraint, we get to see more and more these technologies are becoming economical, especially in cases where aquifers are being depleted. So the regional uh, context is a critical player here. And the same goes when we talk about value-added products, whether these are ashes on the upper left corner or aquatic plants like duckweed you're seeing in the middle top or larva, and again, Dr. Vias talked about it, or compost or even dried algae. These can be used in a whole wide range of applications from feed to extracting fuels and value-added chemicals. The critical variable that we always look into is how economically viable it is and how, whether we are actually unintentionally um, it creating an, uh, an inefficiency or an emission or a loss in another point in the system. So final thoughts here is really to start to think about the scale of why we are looking into the circularity and to look into the economic benefits and ensure there is an alignment. We still have more room to go, especially to get a lot of these interventions that we know are environmentally sustainable to line up economically. We also know that metrics or how we are measuring these circularity is going to be very critical um, to actually measuring how good we are doing and whether we are harming one aspect in improving the other. And with that, I'd like to uh, thank you and uh, hand it over to Dr. Anderson. Mm -hmm.